I will start out with the uh, always obligatory intro. Uh, I am Grant Skinner. I run a shop called gskinner.com. Um, and traditionally, we were a Flash development house. Uh, I always considered myself an interactive developer and my shop an interactive development shop. But um, up until very recently, Flash was really the only technology that let us build the types of experiences that we wanted to build. And as such, uh, we were often considered a Flash development shop. Uh, about a year ago, uh, maybe a year and a half ago, uh, we were approached by Microsoft and they said, hey, we're really familiar with the work that you do with Flash. Uh, we have this new browser coming out, IE9. We'd love to see what you guys can do with HTML5. And specifically, we'd like to see if you can build a full-fledged casual game using HTML5 and JavaScript. And we kind of reluctantly said, sure. Uh, there's a lot of suspicion in the office, but uh, ultimately, we wound up building a game called Pirates Love Daisies. <clears throat> and uh, at the time, this was uh, quite a bit of a challenge. And we had to build a lot of our own tools and libraries and things like this. And this was um, all built on top of HTML5 Canvas. And it used the audio tag and local storage and basically as many HTML5 features as we could cram in uh, to build what is, was at the time um, a fairly advanced HTML5 game. So fast forward to today. And uh, we built a few more games in the last little while. And I wanted to come and talk to you guys about our experience working with Canvas, uh, specifically the 2D context in Canvas, uh, not WebGL. Uh, some of the challenges that we've run into, some of the solutions that we've created. I want to talk about uh, an open source library that we have developed called EaselJS that's helped us solve a lot of these problems. And just some sort of general tips and some of the things that we've learned over the last year and a half. <clears throat> and while this uh, session is titled Diving Deep into Canvas, I have 45 minutes, so really we're more going to scratch the surface. <clears throat> so really quick refresher, what is Canvas? Canvas is an HTML5 element. Uh, it's specifically for dynamic drawing, and it has multiple contexts. Right now, there's only two contexts. One is WebGL, which of course is based on OpenGL ES2. Uh, and is great for building 3D content. <clears throat> and you've heard a lot about that so far. And the other is the 2D context, which is specifically for 2D content. Uh, it has APIs for drawing vector graphics, um, uh, drawing bitmaps to screen, and uh, manipulating pixel data directly. <clears throat> and we're going to focus on 2D. So I'm going to sort of refer to Canvas the Canvas is 2D context generically as Canvas, so just so that I don't need to uh, spit out that whole thing the whole time. Uh, so what's the good side of Canvas right now? Canvas is a pretty old API, actually. Uh, it dates back to 2004. It really started to gain some traction in 2006. And uh, what that means is it's actually pretty broadly available as, as far as HTML5 specs go. Uh, right now it's about 80% penetration, about 80% of internet users have Canvas in some form on their, uh, their desktop and or mobile device. It's also very consistently implemented. I mean, really consistently implemented as far as HTML specs go. Um, we've seen very little variation in the API. Uh, small things like uh, Opera has some differences in numeric pre precision and shadows seem to break every second version in Firefox. But uh, shadows are evil anyway, so we're not going to worry about those too much. But the core API is very consistent. <clears throat> Relative to something like WebGL, Canvas is very easy to get started with. Um, it's only a couple of lines of code to actually see something show up on screen, as opposed to hundreds of lines of preparatory code to get something to show up in WebGL. And this means that you can learn it very incrementally. You can start from nothing, see some results, and build up from there. <clears throat> it's also becoming increasingly performant. Um, right now, about half the implementations for Canvas are hardware and half are software. Software has gotten much faster over the last year or so. 
and hardware is uh, uh, really starting to shine. We're seeing some really good results out of it. Um, as an example of this, um, uh, performance. So a year ago, uh, as Paul was mentioning, the HTML DOM was basically the fastest way to push content onto the screen. Um, today, we're seeing results more like this. So this is 1,000 particles in Safari 5.1. Safari 5.1 has a hardware implementation of Canvas. And you can see that with the HTML DOM, we can get about seven frames per second. SVG, we can get about six. Canvas, we're getting about 88 frames per second. Uh, this WebGL implementation is not a fair comparison. We can absolutely get faster performance than this. This is what one of my guys with no WebGL experience was able to hack together in a couple of days, which I think is an example of the sort of ramp up to get things to work in Canvas versus WebGL. Absolutely, a WebGL expert could get much better results than this. Uh, and libraries are going to make this easier for the average person to work with WebGL. But if you're just starting from scratch, it's very difficult to get great results on WebGL without uh, an investment. And Flash's display list is giving us about 35 frames per second. Um, with stage 3D, again, we can get much better results than we can using the software display list in Flash. Likewise, we're seeing huge increases in performance as these implementations move to hardware. So this is comparing Safari 5.0 versus Safari 5.1. Uh, this is showing the number of sprites we can draw to screen at 20 frames per second. So Safari 5.0, software renderer, about 900 sprites at 20 frames per second. In 5.1, hardware, close to 5,000. Uh, iOS 5, which was one of the worst performers with Canvas, uh, was about, uh, I think we got like 60 sprites at 20 frames per second, so barely enough to do even a very simple game. With 5.1, we're looking at about 1,800. So performance is getting much better. <clears throat> so Canvas is great for building 2D games. It's great for doing visualizations, data visualizations, graphing, uh, special effects, these types of things. But it does come with its own set of challenges. And we need to address those challenges in order to build great content. So I'm going to look at, uh, I think, six challenges that we've run into building content with Canvas. <clears throat> so the first of these is that Canvas has a di direct drawing mode, right? We're just drawing pixels to a surface. Uh, there's no display list, there's no scene graph. We're in charge of managing all of our objects ourselves. And we can, of course, do this manually. We can build up a big object tree, uh, paint things to screen every frame. Um, but of course, it's easier if we can rely on existing libraries. And there are a bunch of libraries out there. Uh, things like processing JS, which is really targeted towards sort of visual experiments, data visualization. Uh, 3.js, which is a great 3D library, uh, runs on WebGL, and it'll fall back on Canvas. Um, and then there's a bunch of sort of purpose-built game frameworks that are targeted at different types of games. When we built Pirates Love Daisies, we also built this library called EaselJS. And EaselJS is really targeted at being a general purpose display list for Canvas. <clears throat> so, uh, we didn't build it as a game library. We tried to build it as something that manages the scene graph for you and that people could extend to build game libraries and things like that on top of it. Right now, the main trunk is targeted entirely at Canvas, but uh, I'll show you a little, la little bit later on some of the experimental stuff we're doing with Canvas that makes, uh, just like Paul was talking about, that adds uh, hot swappable renderers. <clears throat> so, Easel has a pretty shallow hierarchy. We have a bunch of display objects, things like shapes, bitmaps, um, bitmap sequences, which are basically sprite sheet sprites, uh, text containers, which let us aggregate sprites together, and a stage, which represents the root of our display list. <clears throat> if you have any flash background, some of this might look familiar, right? I come from a flash background. I model what I know, and I think also that you know, Macromedia and Adobe have invested 15 years into trying to make display lists make sense to people, 
And it made sense to sort of model after that, both so that we could leverage existing knowledge with Flash developers and also leverage the existing R&D that Adobe has done into trying to make this stuff make sense. Uh, we have some other classes, uh, DOM element, which I'll get into later. We have a ticker class that manages the heartbeat for your application, um, but it's completely optional. Uh, some utilities, some geom uh, classes, and uh, we also have a filters model. So we can do things like blurs and uh, color shifts and stuff like that right inside of the display list. <clears throat> kind of the core philosophies that drive easel. Uh, we want it to be very intuitive. So part of that was leveraging this existing API from Flash. Part of it was just making the code very readable, having a very simple API, having good docs, uh, which is sometimes sadly missing in the uh, open source world. We want it to be generic, so we didn't want this to be a library for building platform games. We wanted this to be a library for doing any type of visual work on top of Canvas. We wanted it to be modular, so we didn't want this to be one huge library that you had to take everything from if you wanted to build anything. In fact, everything, everything is pretty much built to stand alone, so you can actually take things like our graphics class if you just want an easier way to draw vectors to Canvas. It doesn't need to be part of the display list. Our filters, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> my allergies are not liking something in San Francisco. Our filters are completely standalone, so you can just apply a filter to a context and it'll run in that context. Um, but of course, you can also add them into the display list. Even our individual display objects uh, can be drawn into a context outside of a display list and work that way. We want it to be very performant, so we don't want to add a lot of overhead for using Easel versus just calling Canvas directly, because of course that would reduce the, um, the likelihood people would use it. And of course we want it to be open, so it has a uh, GitHub repo uh, mailing list and uh, it's all MIT licensed, so you can do pretty much anything you want with it. <clears throat> uh, code is very simple and looks pretty straightforward, especially if you have any flash experience. Uh, so basically we create a stage, point it at a canvas, and um, uh, we can create display objects and add those into our scene graph or our display list. And then uh, whenever we want the stage to repaint, we just call stage.update. So this is a very simple demo, which results in a red circle on a background, which is where all great graphics systems start. <laughs> So the second challenge that we have with Canvas, uh, Canvas has no scene graph, it has no concept of objects, and so of course it has no way to deal with mouse interaction, right? We just get a mouse event for the entire Canvas. So we need to deal with this manually as well. And there's a few approaches that we can take. Uh, a lot of the game libraries just ignore it, right? They do keyboard interaction, and that's fine. I mean, a, a large portion of games will work with that with no problem. Uh, our initial implementation that we did for Pirates, um, we also kind of ignored it. We went with just a math-based based approach. So we had a hex map, we just calculated which hex tile you clicked on. So it, it actually kind of has frustrating results if you play the game, because you can't click on a pirate specifically, you have to click on the ground under the pirate. Um, because we're just calculating which tile you click on instead of doing actual hit testing. <clears throat> Uh, some people overlay DOM elements, so you can um, uh, capture the clicks with the DOM elements over top of your canvas. Uh, but if we want to get really accurate, we need to check pixels, right? We need to actually check which pixel did we click through. We need to iterate through our entire display tree, draw things out one thing at a time, and check to see when the pixel that's under the mouse actually changes color. Uh, but we can speed this up quite a bit by doing this on a single pixel canvas. So instead of drawing everything onto a full size canvas and checking the pixel on that canvas that the mouse is on, we can actually transform everything into a single pixel coordinate system and check to see if that one pixel on the canvas ever changes. And that's what we do in Easel. So we do all of our math using uh, 2D matrices and we basically just manipulate that matrix so that the mouse represents that single pixel uh, ca uh, canvas. And so we're only ever rendering a single pixel. And it actually runs really quickly, um, almost surprisingly quickly. And so we expose this in a really easy way. 
um, you basically just say my display object dot on press or on click or on release. Uh, and then because we don't want to be tracking everything that you're, um, uh, every single motion against every single object, we uh, provide mouse moves and mouse ups on a global basis through the initial mouse event object. So when we get an on press, for example, you get an event object that has an on mouse move um, event, and that'll get triggered for the until the release happens. So I can do things like drag and drop with a, with very little overhead, <coughs> and also things like mouse over uh, rollovers and rollouts. <clears throat> Third challenge we have to deal with is content. Uh, Canvas is not good at displaying content. It's really, it's not the medium it's designed for. You don't want to display, <coughs> pardon me, you don't want to display text or forms or um, things that the DOM is traditionally very good at dealing with inside of Canvas. The text API in Canvas is very poor, very limited, <coughs> and really almost all we use it for is showing things like FPS counters. Um, however, of course, we have this whole DOM surrounding our Canvas, and so we can layer these elements and we can take advantage of what the DOM does really well. We can do our entire UI inside of the DOM, and we can do our game engine inside of Canvas. The other nice thing today is that we have CSS transforms, which allow for a matrix transformation. And so we can actually deal with the same math to manipulate our Canvas that we're using to manipulate our DOM. And that allows us to sync those things up. And I'm going to show you an example of how we do that inside of uh, Easel in just a second. <clears throat> so this is another game that we built uh, fairly recently uh, called Tankster. It was uh, mainly a tech demo for the Azure team at Microsoft. And I just wanted to show it to demonstrate that all of this is the DOM, right? Our entire UI <coughs> is built in the DOM, and our uh, game map itself is all EaselJS. So pretty much anywhere you see text, or we have uh, you know, all of this outside Chrome, that's all the DOM, it's all CSS, uh, and then only the tanks and the terrain and the shots themselves are happening inside of the canvas. So we really want to you know, leverage different elements for what they're good at. <clears throat> One of the things we have inside of uh, Easel to make this easy is we have this special display object called DOM element. And basically what it lets us do is associate an element on the DOM back to our Canvas display list. And so this is a simple example where I'm creating a DOM element, I'm pointing it at a div with the ID bubble div, and then I'm actually adding it into a container that's um, aggregating that and this pig graphic. And so I can move my pig around, <coughs> and when I tap, <coughs> pardon me, um, when I tap spacebar, I get this little speech bubble. The speech bubble is all in the DOM, right? So, uh, you know, selectable text. This is just a div layered on top of the canvas. But I don't need to do any of that manipulation myself. I just need to create a DOM element to manage it, and then I can move that whole container around, and both the pig graphic and that DOM element are moved with it. And it deals with things like alpha, so I can alpha this in and out, um, full transforms, and, uh, and even bacon explosions. Um, so this makes it a lot easier for things like chats or stuff like that, where we have text elements that we want to have as part of the game, and it lets us leverage what HTML is great for, right? So it lets us build content that isn't just a traditional game, but actually integrates web services and stuff like that, and HTML content right into our game board. Um, and it's kind of interesting, because if we don't um, limit uh, our boundaries on the container div, we can actually have elements that extend past the canvas, right? So these bubbles are going past the edges of the canvas um, because, again, they're just part of the DOM. So another big challenge working with Canvas is, of course, performance. And we really have two things that we need to think about with this. Um, 
One is sort of general performance that applies to all the content that we're building. And then we have a lot of performance variability that we need to uh, concern ourselves with. <clears throat> so in terms of general performance, it mostly boils down to just redrawing only when and what we need to. Uh, so part of that is choosing a reasonable frame rate. As game developers, there's this like um, mentality that you need to hit 60 frames per second. And that's not always the best option, right? If, if we think about what happens in each frame, frames extend if they take longer. So if we're trying to hit you know, 50 frames per second, one frame takes 50 milliseconds to run, the next one takes 10 milliseconds to run, we're going to get uh, a stuttering frame rate. We're going to get frames that vary in length. And that's very easy to pick up visually, right? Humans are really good at seeing that kind of variance. Whereas if we choose a slower frame rate, not only are we going to use less CPU, but we're going to have a more consistent frame rate. And that's generally uh, better from a visual sense. So a higher frame rate isn't always better. You want to kind of play around and try and find the right frame rate for the targets that you're trying to hit. Drawing vectors, very expensive, especially when we're looking at hardware implementations, because hardware is not very good at drawing vectors. Um, and text is also very expensive. Um, you can actually draw quite a bit in a frame, but relative to just drawing images on screen, these are very expensive operations. So we want to try and cut them down as much as we can. <clears throat> One of the ways that we can do this is uh, we can actually draw other canvases back into a canvas. And so we can cache our content out to other canvases. So we can draw a bunch of vectors into a different canvas, keep those static, and just keep drawing that back into our main canvas, right back onto our game board. And so you can use this very aggressively. Uh, the same goes for like aggregate content. So if you have a bunch of images that come together to form one element, like a background, for example, that isn't going to change a lot or be animated, you can draw that off to a separate canvas and then draw that canvas back in. <clears throat> And we actually expose this um, as an API in Easel to make it really easy to work with. This was mentioned with regards to WebGL yesterday. But the number of pixels we draw is not necessarily the number of pixels we display. When you create a canvas element, you set a width and height, which indicates the pixel width and pixel height of that element. But then we can use style sheets to scale that up to whatever we want. And so the less pixels we're drawing, the faster it's going to run. Um, I wouldn't say that it necessarily looks as good as scaling up WebGL content, but for something like a high DPI phone display, you can get away with like a 2x scale and still have it look quite good and maybe get a performance boost that, you, that might make the game more playable overall. Uh, shadows are absolutely the devil. They will tempt you. You will, <laughs> you will want to use them because, hey, it would be so much easier to do a status effect by just putting a glow on this, this sprite but they are so slow. They will bring, particularly on mobile, they will bring your game to, the, to its knees with like one shadow. So completely avoid using shadows if you're at all concerned about performance. <clears throat> Another trick with software renderers specifically is to draw your images on a whole pixel. Um, you can get upwards of a 10x performance increase for drawing images to your canvas versus drawing them off pixel. This does not really help at all with hardware implementations. Um, and I'm going to show you a quick demo of this in action. I'm going to show it to you in Chrome, because Chrome on OS X is still a software implementation. <clears throat> and then I'm going to show it to you in Safari to show you <laughs> the fun of all this. So these are a bunch of uh, individual sprites animating around. Um, and you can see we're getting about four frames per second. This is uncached. If I turn on caching, this is just going to call this method inside of easel, uh, display object .cache. That'll draw each of these vector sprites out into a separate canvas, right? So, uh, and then we're just going to draw them back as images. So just doing that, pretty good performance increase, right? About three times the performance up to about 12 frames per second. Uh, but these are drawing on fractional pixels right now, uh, just whatever they happen to land on. If we round that, uh, and I can do this in easel just by setting a global flag, then we get a really significant jump in uh, performance. So we're up to about 25 frames per second. So that looks great, right? 
pretty easy and free way to increase our performance. Problem is, is that it doesn't work quite the same on hardware. And so this is where we start getting into performance variability, right? So this is on Safari. Um, we're getting about 11 frames per second. Not bad, a little faster. But we're going to turn on the cache. Huge pause while all of these things get pushed into the texture buffer, right? And then we drop a ton of frames per second. We're down to like six frames per second. Normally, turning on caching speeds things up in Safari. I haven't, I'm not 100% sure why this slows down, but I think it's because we have 2,000 individual sprites here that are all being cached separately, and I think we're just overloading the texture memory. And I think it's either falling back on software or it's doing a lot of like memory swaps that's really slowing down that hardware implementation. If this was just a few big things and we, a few big vector elements and we cast them all, Safari would run way faster. But with all of these small individual textures, it seems to slow way down. And so, and Snap to Pixel isn't gonna make any difference, at, well actually it seems to slow it down a little bit more, but um, really doesn't make much difference at all to a hard, hardware implementation, because it doesn't care if it's drawing on a full pixel or not. Uh, and so this, so it starts to demonstrate the performance variability that we're running into with Canvas, where we really need to test things on the platforms that we're targeting. So, you know, we look at the desktop market, pretty big variation, but really most of our metrics are high enough that we can build the type of content that we want, unless we go crazy. Um, Safari and IE9 both have hardware implementations of Canvas, and so as a result, we see the best, best performance out of them. Uh, Chrome 14 for Windows, I believe, has hardware. Now, Firefox, I think, also has hardware, although it does not work on my MacBook Air. Um, and so we're looking at software renderers here versus hardware renderers here. Um, as, a, sorry, as a quick example of uh, how this content, um, how this performance has changed over the last year, I'm going to show you a quick demo that I built a year ago for an IE9 press event. It was specifically designed to destroy CPUs, right? The whole goal was to show that only IE9 could run this thing because it, was, it had a hardware implementation uh, and it was designed to, to go down to about one or two frames per second on software renderers. Uh, a year later, this is in um, uh, Safari 5.1. Can we turn the music up a little bit? Is that? Show up on this page. So I'll just turn this down and talk over it. <clears throat> so, a year ago, this would drop to about a frame per second when it hit, you know, the big glowy part of it. Um, Safari 5.1 ran it at a solid 20 frames per second. It would never drop. I noticed yesterday that Safari 5.1.1 runs it, drops down to about 16 frames per second. And even the software renderers, things like Chrome, will run this at a pretty consistent 15 frames per second. So we've come a long way in the last year. As sort of an anecdotal note, um, hopefully you can see there's some like little tiny sparks flying around on the edges. So, on the flight down to this PR event, I thought it would be an awesome idea to add these like little tiny sparks just to have like that much more visual interest in this whole thing. Uh, and I got to the, and it was running great in IE9 before I got on the flight. I got down there, I went to the rehearsal, and this thing ran at like one frame per second on IE9. And I was like, oh my god, their laptops are broken. But. <laughs> It turned out that IE9 just choked with these small particles. Um, again, I'm not sure why, but yet another example of how performance is really dependent on the type of content you're pushing at it. Software renderers saw almost no difference when I put these small particles in, because software renderers mostly care about the size of things, how many pixels they're drawing. Uh, hardware, though, hated it. 
This is the mobile market right now. Um, massive variation, right? We have the playbook. We're getting like maybe 40 sprites at 20 frames per second. Uh, Galaxy Tab, Android device, about 200. An old Nexus One, we're getting around 100, 120. Um, iOS 4 had horrible canvas performance. We got about 60 uh, sprites at 20 frames per second. Whereas iOS 5, they've moved to hardware. You can see we have great performance now. We have uh, you know, close to 2,000 sprites at, at 20 frames per second. <clears throat> A year ago, this was cutting edge content on iPad 2 and Canvas. This was, <laughs> we were hired to build this little uh, visual piece for a uh, iPad gaming magazine. And this runs at 10 frames per second. We're caching everything. <laughs> we're shutting down the ticker anytime that there's some content running. Uh, we had to use every trick we could possibly come up with to get this to run. And it runs fine on iPad 1, but this was the absolute limit of what we could get to work. With iPad 2, the Pirates Love Daisies game that I showed you that a year ago was designed to push desktop computers to their edge now runs pretty much perfectly fine with no tweaks. Uh, there are a few little tweaks we could make that would make it run smooth as butter. So it should be coming obvious that performance is chaotic, right? It's fairly unpredictable. And this is a big challenge. In order for us to know that our content is going to run well, we need to benchmark the devices that we're going to run our content on, the, the devices that we're going to target. And much more importantly, as Justin was saying yesterday, we need to actually run our content on those devices, right? The real content. We need to be testing constantly to make sure that things are going to run well. So our sort of first line of defense in this is, um, and actually where a lot of these benchmarks came from, is a simple little script that I put together that runs a suite of Canvas benchmarking scripts. Uh, and basically what it does is it tries to push an increasing amount of content at uh, 100 frames per second. And the minute we get uh, an average frame rate that drops below 20 frames per second, we consider that the threshold. And we uh, spit out a benchmarking number. And so this lets us, and then it uh, stores all of this data back to our server in, in a format that we can farm. And so every time we get a new device or a new software update, we run this. It takes you know, 30 seconds and, well, it takes a few minutes to actually run, but it takes 30 seconds to actually do the test. And then we have this nice big pool of data that tells us you know, what's possible, where are the slow parts of Canvas on different devices. We still get surprises once in a while when we're building real content because benchmarks are never true metrics, but it gives us a pretty good idea of where we're starting. Um, right now, this is private. But if people are interested in it, uh, we might be able to like, clean it up and uh, make it a little more public. Challenge five is there's still some pieces missing in Canvas that would make life a lot easier. Um, I mean, <clears throat> these are things that are really hard to work around just with straight JavaScript. So one of them is draw boundaries. It's very hard. One of the, the top requests we get for Easel is the ability to get or set width and height on any display object. And we can do that reasonably well with things like uh, bitmaps, because we know their dimensions. But when it comes to things like vectors, we really have no way of calculating that. I mean, we can. We can run a whole bunch of math. But when you start trying to deal with concatenated matrices and vectors that are being drawn, uh, the expense is way beyond the actual ex cost of drawing those things. And so the ability to. Uh, query a draw as it happens to get back the pixel bounds of whatever was drawn would really make our lives a lot easier for, for things like this. Um, <clears throat> right now, we have access to pixel data, which we can manipulate in JavaScript, which is very slow. I mean, JavaScript has gotten much more performant over the years, but it's still way slower than anything else in Canvas right now in the hardware implementations. And so I would love to see fast shaders for Canvas so that we can do uh, pixel manipulation on hardware. Uh, Adobe recently proposed a spec for CSS shaders. And I'd love to see that extended or have a sister spec that brought the same shader spec to Canvas. Uh, and this, you know, beyond games, it has a lot of value in things like photo manipulation apps and stuff like that. 
uh, particularly as we start getting uh, like media access, so access to a webcam, things like that, we can do really cool effects in, in Canvas using shaders. We have no concept of 3D or even 2.5D in Canvas, and there's not really any effective way of faking it. Um, we can't do any kind of distortion. So having per perspective distortions or quad-based distortions would be really nice. We can't draw full DOM elements. We can draw video, we can draw images, and we can draw other canvas elements. But we can't draw you know, a div full of content. And this would open up uh, a lot of other opportunities as well. There's very little state introspection on canvas. It's really hard to tell, do I have a path already? Um, have I already started drawing a path? How deep am I in um, the state stack? You know, can I? Uh, am I reset? Do I have a, a, tra um, a transformation already active? Stuff like this you have to manage on your own. It would be kind of nice to query Canvas directly for it. Finally, and I think this is big and it applies really to HTML5 uh, game development in general, is that we have a real lack of tools right now. Uh, building Pirates of Daisies, we had to build all of our own tools. Uh, again, everything from libraries, to actual little applications that made our lives easier. Um, so for example, to create sprite sheets, uh, our illustrators were really familiar with building assets in Flash. You know, they were great at it. They knew how to do all the animation, all the art. Uh, and so we had to build a custom tool uh, called Zoe, which we released for free and actually very recently open sourced, which lets us bring in any Swift and uh, export this out as a sprite sheet. And we can you know, jump through labels, it automatically calculates bounds, um, and it dumps this along with uh, label information ready to use inside of Easel, so that we can just bring it into a uh, bitmap sequence object, and we can say go to and play, go to and stop, just like we would in Flash. And it let us have this application running while illustrators were working and we could really quickly update all of our assets for the game uh, and see those changes immediately. <clears throat> uh, and there's many sprite sheet applications out there. I mean, another one that does a very similar function is Swift Sheet. Um, at Max, Adobe previewed Flash Pro Rubin, and one of the features they're showing off is sprite sheet generation, and that actually ha is an extensible feature, so you can write um, JSFL to make custom exporters for sprite sheets. And uh, they actually showed off, a, as an example, uh, EaselJS export directly from, uh, EaselJS export for sprite sheets specifically, directly from Flash Pro. So this is starting to make it easier to bring game assets into your games. Profiling, at least on the rendering side, is really difficult in Canvas. Uh, we, you know, obviously we can use all the browser profiling tools, but that doesn't really tell us what's happening on the rendering side. Um, we can get hints of information by using more system, like system profiling tools to see what's happening on the GPU. But um, I think it might have been Paul the other day who, who suggested like a heat map on Canvas that could show you where time was being spent on a render. And you know, I would love uh, tools like that. Finally, I want to show you something that I've been playing around with a lot lately, um, or rather over the course of the last six months or so. Um, so again, Flash Pro basically authors all the same types of content that Canvas is good at displaying. And so I've been trying to figure out a way to get this content out of Flash Pro and into our games and into our content. And so I've been working on this custom panel called the EaselJS export panel. And basically what it lets me do is uh, specify where I want to export, where my libraries and images should live, and then I can just hit this export button. And so this is all Flash, and boom, this is now uh, on Canvas in EaselJS. So you can see like these big ugly blocks are vector outputs, um, and it retains the concept of like symbols and instances and text elements, um, and it makes life pretty easy. More recently, uh, in fact, just in the last week or so, I've started to add support for timelines. Um, because getting animations into 
canvas can be very tricky. And so my illustrator put together this, this example of a little robot that does stuff. Um, and before I run this, I just want to show you one other thing. Uh, I added this little JS block uh, inside of a comment, and you can see it just calls alert all done. And if I export this, this is now inside of Canvas. Um, and it looks identical to how it looked in Flash, right? So I can pull this asset in now. I can use it in my game. My illustrators can use a tool that they're very familiar with. And actually, unlike Flash, all of this animation is tween-based, so I can manipulate it in real time. It's a lot easier. And you can see that I can actually inject JavaScript code into this export on frames um, right within Flash. <clears throat> but this is a big thing that needs to be solved, I think, for HTML5 games to become more realistic, is we need this tooling in place. We need ways of getting, it's all great to be able to develop games, but we also need to be able to design them and make them beautiful. And we need workflows that make it easy for illustrators to integrate into this process. So, start wrapping up. Um, it's confusing times, right? Uh, casual games used to be mainly built in Flash. Now Flash is, you know, kind of in a rocky stretch. Uh, we're seeing this, this great abundance of web standards drawing surfaces, and it's hard to decide which ones, which one we should be focusing on. <clears throat> I think we're starting to see more and more that SVG and DOM is kind of ill-suited to this task, right? There's a lot going on. There's a lot of overhead with SVG and the DOM. And <clears throat> so in the long run, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, a year ago, the DOM was one of the few hardware accelerated display lists, or display surfaces that we had, and so it made a lot of sense to build games on it. Now we're starting to see Canvas and WebGL, uh, which are much more purpose-built elements, becoming hardware accelerated, and so it's becoming more clear that this is the future of rich content on the web, or uh, rich interaction. <clears throat> Flash is definitely still a great choice. Uh, it has a mature tool set. It's very ubiquitous, um, very consistent. We don't need to worry about browser inconsistencies. And with Stage 3D, it's also very performant, very fast. The issue, of course, is it right now has a sort of uncertain future. We see iOS has no support for Flash. Windows 8 uh, in their Touch UI They've announced is going to have no support for plugins at all, so no support for Flash. So it's kind of unclear whether or not it makes sense to invest in this if that's the direction that we're going. <clears throat> WebGL, really fast, also really new. Um, there's not a lot of great libraries for this yet. 3JS is one of them, but it's not really targeted at 2D content, so if you're building 2D casual games, not the best option. Uh, not particularly ubiquitous yet, especially on mobile. And it has a very steep learning curve, right? We need a lot of these libraries out there to make this easier to work with. I think today Canvas is a great choice, ubiquitous, consistent. Um, in most places now, it's very performant. Big problem is that we don't have many tools, right? Um, you know, Justin had, Justin yesterday said that he was avoiding Canvas because he needed to support everything. And in his business, that's, you know, that makes a ton of sense. In my business, I have the luxury of saying to hell with you if you don't have a browser that's at least you know, a generation or two old, right? I don't, I don't care about IE6, really, not to build games. Those aren't, that's not my market. I'm interested in people who upgrade on at least a bi-yearly basis. <laughs> and <clears throat> so, for me, today, Canvas is the best choice for building 2D games. However, it's hard to know for sure where this is going. And so, just like Paul, we've been looking at how do we make these renderers swappable. And so, the new version of Easel, which is totally experimental and which we haven't uh, released open source yet, uh, actually allows us to do this. So, this is some very simple content um, running in uh, Canvas running on the DOM. Uh, WebGL, for example. <clears throat> and we even have um, things like a flash surface. So 
the concept being that you can write this content once and swap your renderer, render it out to anything. So if WebGL becomes a future, you know, one day we hope to have a really optimized WebGL renderer uh, that you can just swap in, and suddenly your content is running there perfectly well. <clears throat> I'm going to show you one last thing, just because I'm kind of excited about this. It kind of is obvious if you've seen all these pieces, but um, I just tried this this morning, and I was really excited that it worked, so I wanted to share it. Uh, so I showed you guys our timeline export support, and I just showed you our hot swappable renderers. Uh, so they actually work together. So this is that content running in Canvas. This is running on the DOM. And, you know, et cetera, with SVG and such. <coughs> um, so we're able to take this content and export it for the web and then target the specific renderer that we think is going to be best for the user that we're, we're aiming at. <coughs> so, so I think, you know, the future is rosy. These things are getting much better. The libraries are getting more mature. The tooling is missing but hopefully coming. <coughs> and performance is getting uh, vastly better than it was a year ago. So on that hopefully optimistic note, I'd like to thank you very much. Um, we don't do the one question. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, a lot of really cool performance demos. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the different ways you actually drive these animation loops? There's at least set timeout and request animation frame. Yeah. And you have a lot of experience in this. So I'd love to hear how you're driving all this stuff and what you've learned. OK, so um, you really have three choices, right? You have set interval, set timeout, and request animation frame. Um, <clears throat> we use, so the ticker in Easel uses uh, set timeout or request animation frame. Uh, you, have to re you have to tell it it's allowed to use request animation frame, and of course it'll only use it if it's available, because request animation frame is only uh, on certain browsers. Um, I've read a bunch of stuff that says request animation frame can give you better performance. That hasn't been true in my testing. Um, and actually talking to some engineers at, at some of the browser vendors, they seem to concur that there really isn't a performance benefit to it. However, it does make you a bit better browser citizen because when you switch tabs, your content will get um, dropped down to one frame per second. It also means that if you're using things like DOM element, where the browser has to render uh, DOM content along with Canvas content, that those two renders are going to be synced. So they won't tear, right? You won't get your DOM content slowly following um, your Canvas content. Um, so. Performance-wise, it doesn't really matter, but to be a good browser citizen, request animation frame is probably the way you want to go. Uh, it just means that you need to be aware of the caveats of request animation frame, like the fact that your timing is indeterminate, right? You don't know, are you going to be getting that heartbeat every, you know, at 60 hertz, or are you going to be getting it at 20 hertz? Um, a lot of people seem to assume 60, but that's not a given, so. Does that answer your question, Seth? <laughs> I was just wondering about tools. What's your experience or uh, thoughts uh, about tools like Adobe Edge? Um, well, Edge is really targeted at CSS output right now. Um, you know, I think that uh, they're likely to look at other options, um, but right now it's just CSS. So from our perspective, you know, we've mostly been targeting Canvas and uh, WebGL, and so it's not really a tool that does what we need it to do yet, which is why we've been kind of building our own stuff. But do you, do you see that as a, as a like, you know, something they're going to address or, you know, other tool vendors are going to address? Oh, sense? absolutely. I mean, you're seeing, I mean, Adobe obviously has a big interest in this space. You also have companies like Sencha that are building, you know, animation tools for the web. Okay. Um, but right now, none of them are targeted at, at games, like interactive content, and they're not really targeted at um, Canvas or WebGL. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.